Today on Inside the Issues, Iran and the West. Hello and welcome to this week's special edition of Inside the Issues, a CG online podcast. I'm David Welch, CG Chair of Global Security at the Balsley School of International Affairs and Professor of Political Science at the University of Waterloo. Every week I'm pleased to welcome here into the studios at the Center for International Governance Innovation in Waterloo, Ontario, a guest to talk about some timely and important topic of international governance. And today we have a special edition in the sense that we're not in the studio, we're in the spectacular new auditorium at the CG campus. And I have three guests who are uh, collaborators on a very important and timely project uh, to, to make uh, sense of the complicated and difficult relationship between the United States and Iran in particular, but more broadly, between the West and Iran in general. And uh, the rapid uh, pace of events which some have been uh, worrying uh, seriously might lead to momentum toward a uh, major war in the Middle East. So we're here uh, with these experts to talk about the reasons for this impasse, the uh, reasons for the inability of Iran and the West to solve their problems uh, smoothly through diplomacy. And uh, let me welcome all three. I'll begin on the far left with my colleague, James Blight, who's the uh, CG Chair of Foreign Policy Development at the Balsley School of International Affairs and who has been organizing with uh, his wife and colleague, Janet Lang, uh, a long-standing project on Iran's relations with the West. To Jim's right, uh, Thomas Pickering, a former a American ambassador to a, a wide variety of places, including uh, Jordan, Nigeria, El Salvador, Israel, the United Nations, India, and Russia. And then to my immediate left, Hossein Mousavian, a former I Iranian ambassador to Germany, a former head also of the Foreign Relations Committee of the National Security Council in Iran and a former spokesperson on the nuclear file uh, while uh, President Khatami was um, in office in Tehran. So welcome to all three of you. And Jim, if you don't mind just setting the stage for us a bit, a little context on the project that you've been running for the past few years. <clears throat> sure. Um, about 2004, 2005, a group of us from uh, then of Brown University's Watson Institute, MIT Center for International Studies and the National Security Archive at uh, George Washington University, uh, kind of all came together on a couple of uh, questions. One is, uh, why is the history of Iran's relationship, particularly with the US, but with Europe as well, why is it so relevant? Why can't we, uh, transcend that history? Why do we still wind up shouting at each other? Why are we still threatening each other? As if it were 1979, 1980, 1981, in the immediate aftermath of, of the revolution itself and the overthrow of the Shah. Um, that was one thing. But another one was that even then, it seemed like it was getting more dangerous. That uh, uh, it could actually lead to something beyond a rhetorical flurry or, or exchange. And so we began to look at uh, various points where things went wrong or that they didn't go right. Initiatives that failed, close calls maybe that almost succeeded, why didn't they succeed? Uh, and you can lump all this under uh, the concept of missed opportunities. Were there real opportunities or were there, it was only an illusion of opportunities and we had the advantage of uncovering a lot of newly declassified material from uh, the US government, and we had a great deal of material in Farsi that was translated into English for the first time so that those of us who are uh, monolingual in English could actually read this stuff. Uh, memoirs, speeches by Rafsanjani, uh, by certain military leaders and so forth. And then we did what we do, uh, we pulled together a series, we have pulled together a series of meetings with people like our colleagues here, although I would say there's really nobody like our colleagues here, uh, on uh, the Iran-Iraq war, U.S. role, Iranian perception of the U.S. role, uh, and uh, most recently uh, on the period where President Mohammad Khatami overlapped in his first term with Bill Clinton in his second term because each seemed to want to make this work. And so you had presidents driving um, a, a movement toward rapprochement, but it didn't work either. And in fact, it 
by the time Clinton left office, it's not clear that things were any better than they were than when he entered office. So um, that's where we are. Um, these two guys have been very important. We're, we have another meeting coming up in June on the uh, uh, period of the early George W. Bush administration. And we'll see how that works out. Mm -hmm. So that's where we are. Very good. So every relationship that's problematic has some set of uh, specific detailed issues over which people contend. Those are usually identifiable. And in principle, those are negotiable. You can talk about them at least because you can identify them easily. But there are also deeper issues, almost more atmospheric reasons, possibly even more emotional reasons why the relationship is problematic. Let's start with the deeper issues. Uh, Tom, what exactly, from the American perspective, or at least from your perspective as an American, are sort of the underlying reasons why Iran and the United States have such difficulty getting along and have, have had such difficulty for 33 years? A fundamental reason, David, is separation. Miscommunication or lack of communication and arbitrary interpretation, and it boils down to mistrust, fundamentally bustered, but buttressed by misunderstanding where, in effect, there's almost no opportunity to hear another side of the story to understand what that might be and how and what way that affects things. And so the absence of dialogue and negotiations contributes to it. Specific incidents along the way on both sides have made the relationship particularly vexed as they've gone ahead in this vacuum of no communication. The United States certainly remembers the hostage crisis in, uh, in 78, 79, 79, 80. Uh, there are uh, strong feelings through a whole period, uh, mining of the Gulf, uh, difficulties over uh, how and in what way to deal with the aftermath of the Shah period, uh, money owing on one side or the other. Uh, deep concern for a long period of time over the U.S. perception fundamentally based, as it sees it in strong evidence, that Iran has been supporting Hezbollah and later Hamas in the Middle East, and that at various times Iran has made statements about the Middle East, Ahmadinejad, President Ahmadinejad, on the Holocaust and on Israel and Israel's right to be present in the Middle East, and questions having to do with what are essentially a fundamental belief that for quite a significant period of time Iran was working as hard as it could to block any Middle East peace process uh, well beyond what uh, Iran has said it was doing is to support Palestinian objectives. And so these, among other things, are what I would call the surface manifestations of underneath questions. Deeper than that are, I think, serious questions that both sides have that get into what I call the interstices of uncertainty. Uh, those questions have to do with, well, a uh, deep fear and concern in the United States that the United States is supposed to, at some period of time, in the Iranian view, bless Iran as, in a sense, the major hegemon, if not uh, solely in the region, but as part of world governing relationships and a deep sense of concern. Deep feelings that, in our tradition of separation of church and states, theocracies uh, definitely bring vexing and very serious problems into the international sphere as well as at home. Uh, serious concerns that the Iranian revolution was violent, the aftermath was violent, large numbers of people were killed, many of them uh, taken to be innocents, but under sets of circumstances where international standards of human rights continue not to be met. So we can go on. I mean, there's a long litany. Um, I think that the exposition of the litany is helpful in uh, illuminating the degree of misunderstanding and mistrust. It's not so useful in finding an answer to the problems. I remember when I first started to study foreign languages, and the one question you never asked was why people said things the way they did. They said things the way they did because they said them that way. And to understand why made no sense. To some extent, you have to apply that lesson to the history the history may help you uh, to find a way forward. And that may be the only permissible why in the history, but it is not necessarily a great guide for future work because it is one-sided, emotional, uh, produces 
in my view, extreme thinking about the other, and we see evidence of that today, even as we approach a question of can the two sides get mm -hmm. together and negotiate something. Mm -hmm. So, Hossein, what's the difference between the Iranian view of the deep issues in the U.S.-Iranian relationship? H how different would you characterize it from what Tom has said? Essentially, it's a, a problem of miscommunication and a, a series of specific irritants in the relationship that just keep the state of relations in bed. I fully agree with Tom that we have mistrust, miscommunication, misunderstandings, sometimes also miscalculations and misperceptions. Uh, this is 33 years. The officials of both countries, they have not been able to sit together to discuss the reasons of mistrust. Uh, of course, every side has its own grievances. But it's very important for, I think, for, for both sides in Tehran and Washington to understand the other side has legitimate reasons for mistrust. Tom mentioned, I uh, also can mention, for example, whether this is a misperception or misunderstanding. Uh, majority of Iranians, they really cannot uh, trust uh, the U.S. Uh, policy on human rights or democracy is the real issue. They remember 1953 coup when Iran had uh, a democratically elected prime minister, which the U.S. and the U.K. overthrown and they installed a dictator, and they supported the dictator for 25 years. They are looking to the region. They see Mubarak as a dictator, has been supported by the US and the West for three, four decades with very, very, very poor uh, record of human rights, democracy, a corrupted regime. And they are looking to the other uh, US allies in the region, there is nothing on democracy or human rights which you can be proud uh, in the countries which they are the U.S. allies. Uh, that's why many of them in Iran, they believe uh, issues like terrorism, democracy, uh, human rights are just as uh, used by the West and the U.S. as instrument to dominate the countries. If they can dominate, then if you don't have democracy, human rights, they don't care at all. They, they, they think the U.S. is after oil and energy. They really don't care about uh, human rights and democracy. And so they are very much afraid the U.S. is not ready to respect uh, Iran's independence. And the U.S. is going to dominate, to interfere, and uh, interfere in Iran's internal affairs like the, the 25 years during the Shah, or like the, the, the relation the U.S. has uh, with the other uh, countries as U.S. allies in the region. Uh, but uh, I think uh, more we should uh, think about the future. Uh, enough is enough. I mean, 33 years of hostilities and misunderstandings and mistrust. The, the, the very important point, David, in my mind is that these two countries, uh, if they are not the most important uh, uh, countries uh, having a role on major issues for on stability and security in Persian Gulf and security, at least they are between the most important. The U.S. is international power and the most powerful uh, foreign actor in the region, no doubt about it. And Iran is sitting on Persian Gulf from one side, 50% of uh, the Persian Gulf. Uh, the other side of Iran is Caspian Sea, the, uh, another source of energy. The U.S. and the West and the international crisis are maybe the most important real ones are Iraq, Afghanistan, and peace process.
I don't believe really Iranian nuclear issue is a real international crisis. I think the West has mm, made it mm, a lot exaggerations to bring this at the top agenda. But the real issue is Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, peace process, and the security stability in the region. And if, if, if they, they, we can bring a kind of understanding between Iran and the US, I think they would be the most powerful countries to support a, a new structure for peace, security, stability in Persian Gulf, a durable, a sustainable stability, which can ensure, should ensure, uh, the, the healthy export of energy and oil for uh, the international community in the sterilized countries, to bring uh, a sustainable peace in Afghanistan, which the, the, the security in Afghanistan is uh, uh, really a disaster. The situation of Iraq, and all these definitely in the future would have a great impact on the other countries. Everybody is worried about Syria. I mean, again, here, Iran and the US, they can play a constructive role to, to, to bring uh, a kind of peace in the Syrian crisis. Uh, one big issue which is missing, and uh, I really regret, Tehran and Washington, they have not been able to work on the issues of common interests. And I really don't understand why for at least last decade, they are concentrate, uh, concentrating only on the nuclear issue. And from the US point of view or Western point of view, first they should resolve the nuclear issue then they uh, would be able to go to the other issue. This is a, a very big mistake. Because uh, on the nuclear issue, Iran is a member of NPT. Iran doesn't have nuclear weapon. Iran has not decided to, di to divert toward uh, uh, nuclear weapon. Iran uh, is ready for any kind of transparency measure assuring the international com community on non-diversion. Maybe Iran is the only country, Tom, if I'm wrong, you correct me. Maybe Iran is the only country which religiously has obliged and committed itself uh, against weapons of mass destruction. We have member, uh, uh, a lot of countries member, uh, members of NPT, but I don't remember any other country which religiously also has obligation for itself beyond the NPT. Mm -hmm. These are very positive issues. These can be settled easily. And even if they cannot, David, to settle it, why they do not start to cooperate on common interest issues like Afghanistan? I mean, we do want to talk about these issues uh, in a minute, but okay. I'm still on the theme of the deep underlying causes of discord. I'm struck that neither of you made reference to the fact that the United States is a liberal democratic country coming out of the Western Enlightenment tradition. Iran is an Islamic Republic, uh, enormous cultural gap between the two countries. Uh, Jim and I have done a lot of work together and one of our most powerful findings in the research we've done on various crises around the world is that lack of empathy is probably the single biggest obstacle to cooperation, to actually solving tangible problems and uh, sitting well, David, on the sidelines, I think we, seemed to me that being enormous I think we emphasized that both of us began with the idea of no communications, mistrust, and misunderstanding. That is exactly the point that you're making in a more positive way, that you're saying we lack empathy, and we're saying, of course we do. We lack empathy because we lack understanding, we lack trust, we lack communications. We have misperceptions, as Hussein said, we make miscalculations as a result of it, and I think that it may be that we're defining the same problem from two different perspectives, but I don't Why think we're different. Why was there so little communication? Because, in effect, the hostage crisis and the ensuing enmity and the continued uh, ability of each side to contribute in its own way to that meant that contacts were ruled out. I think it, of course, is absolutely crazy, but we have instances, certainly in United States history, over a period of time 
and where the lack of communication, particularly with the People's Republic of China between 49 and 71, uh, conditioned as it was by many of the same sets of circumstances, uh, in effect made things worse. You're in a downward spiral. And so the circumstances of the downward spiral will continue in domestic political terms, in national interest terms, whatever you want to call it, uh, to keep the thing coming apart rather than pulling it together. Now, both made reference to the a perception of the other as seeking some kind of regional hegemony. Uh, American worry that Iran, the Islamic Republic of Iran, would like to dominate the Gulf region. The Iranian fear that the United States would like to dominate the Gulf sure. region. Uh, my guess is that both countries overestimate the extent to which the other country is actually interested in hegemony. Would you agree or disagree? Me? Hmm. Yes, you are true that there are uh, uh, overestimation from both sides. But, but still the fact is, I believe, the U.S. and Iran are the most important uh, elements for a future establishment on a regional cooperation system, for example, in the Persian Gulf. Although we have our neighbors, GCC countries, but since 1990, when Rafsanjani was president, Iran offered them a regional cooperation system, a, a kind not only on security and stability, on economic issues, terrorism, drugs, organized crime, uh, everything, like something like uh, EU cooperation. And at the highest level, frequently we discussed with them uh, we, were, we were thinking, and still we believe, this is the best way of confidence-building measures. Uh, the Europeans also, they had the, f the, the same fairness of Germany because of the two world war, the weight of Germany, German hegemony. But, but, but they could resolve it through a regional cooperation system, which today, small countries in Europe, they, they, they feel comfortable like Norway, all these small countries, even if they have had very, very dark history together, like France and uh, Germany. Mm -hmm. this, this is the only way, not, this is not today, believe me. Uh, I remember uh, it, it, it was in 1990, the first meeting I had in Germany, just a day after my arrival, which was uh, Foreign Minister Genscher, and I told him uh, this would be a long-term solution for stability in the region. He was surprised it's coming such an idea from Iranian side. He told me I whether this is my idea or the country's idea. I said, no, I know president, I know his mindset, I'm working with him for a decade. It was so important for him, Tom, that he decided to pay immediately a visit to Tehran. And he sat with Rafsanjani for 90 minutes. Mm -hmm. With 70 minutes, he just discussed this regional cooperation system. Mm -hmm. And Rafsanjani gave him a complete carte blanche. And he was extremely happy and excited. He came back and he told me, uh, Ambassador, I would go to Washington. I would discuss this is the way. Five, six months later, I met him and he told me, you know, there is no interest in Washington. Mm -hmm. And I, I think these, these are the major issues. Maybe sometimes a, a mediator cannot uh, communicate or uh, maybe the U.S. didn't want Germany to interfere. I don't know. I mean, what was the reason? I but think it was basic skepticism. But uh, without interrupting you, saying I'm sorry. But... Uh, David raised a very interesting question with respect to the United States. It's much deeper than Iran. It's the question of how the United States views itself and why the world views it in many cases so entirely differently. And it's a troubling and difficult question. It's a question I've pondered a lot. Uh, I would make just a few remarks on it. Uh, I grew up uh, in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Uh, and it was the pre-war, post-war period. 
when the United States envisaged itself as the kind of uh, wonderfully moral, totally democratic state emerging from the Second World War as the savior of the world, in a situation where it sought in its own view uh, no territory, uh, no compensation, and tried in its own way uh, to lead in a direction that tried to celebrate what it thought was its principles. And halfway through the half decade after the war, uh, then confronted uh, an ideological division across the world uh, that made uh, all of these aspirations, which were now considered kind of in the kumbaya school of diplomacy, <laughs> uh, entirely different. Uh, and the Cold War hardened the outlook. It hardened the views. It hardened a tendency on the part of the United States as it realized both its enormous power and its enormous responsibilities uh, to believe that it had the opportunity for better thinking and therefore should reflect that back into the world community, particularly those who were close to it. One or two things saved us in the Cold War from uh, absolute certainty and total resort to just do it my way. It's going to be OK. We know how better to do these things. And that was the fact that we had consideration for allies. We had consideration for the fact that no one state had the capacity to think all things right, to understand all difficulties, and in fact to operate as a major power in the world. Following the end of the Cold War, we slipped away from what I would have called at least the consultative aspects of international cooperation during the Cold War. It functioned heavily in NATO. Mm -hmm. It functioned at the United Nations to an extent. It functioned in other places where we worked with friends. It was never perfect. Uh, we had differences in ideas, but there was at least some interest and some compulsion to try to resolve these. Because if we hadn't resolved them, we would have opened ourselves to the other side's uh, activities to split us, divide us up, and to carve off the pieces. Uh, that changed. And it changed in a way that was, I think, very difficult for the US to make the mental shifts. And so the compulsion for uh, a more cooperative leadership fell away. And the determination of a more hegemonic approach became a kind of opium that was very hard to resist. It had its ultimate uh, disaster, in my view, in the decision to go into Iraq. I think that Afghanistan was justifiable on the basis that we were attacked. We knew the locus of the attack. We had warned, and in days, many cases, and I participated in meetings with the Taliban to try to get them to understand the danger they were undergoing by sheltering al-Qaeda. Uh, but that meant that we are now in this midterm of not yet contending with the future in a set of terms that I think we in the international community find entirely comfortable, but a struggle for that. And I think it's what President Obama has been trying to do. But it is a long and difficult course. Uh, it is true that we have no territorial ambitions, and we've been very careful about that. But we have had large amounts of overseas deployment for long periods of time of military forces. Uh, some of it successful and some of it useful. Uh, but we have become very concerned about the fact that at the end of the Cold War, we were kind of losing ground. And so that's been a compulsion, a compulsion to bad behavior as well as good behavior. And we're struggling for a paradigm. Uh, the Cold War paradigm was commitment of uh, us and others in containment of the Soviet Union. The, the new paradigm is much less clear. I think one element of the new paradigm has to be engagement. So we come back to what Hussein recommended with respect to dealing with the region. It would be, in my view, a terrible mistake for the US and Iran to see themselves as self-appointed leaders of the region. We have to work with other parties. Yes. We have relations with Israel. Uh, those are in contention with our relations with the Arab world. They're in contention with our non-relations with Iran, which I hope to see move into something like relations. Uh, we have to deal with that. I think Iran has to deal with that. 
Uh, Iran has superficially excellent relations with the Arabs, but deep underground on both sides, there's suspicions and misunderstandings and mistrust and all the other things that well up. Uh, I believe that there is no single easy formula to resolve these, but the absence of communications is a pretty disastrous uh, recipe uh, for failure to try to move toward understanding. That's sort of a long story, but it's an interesting story, and those of us who struggled in American foreign policy to make it relevant, uh, to make it responsive, uh, have, have dealt with that. I, for one, believe there was never a unipolar moment, if you define that as on critical questions, being able to decide and compel uh, that decision through an international cooperative process. We've had to persuade. We've lost some of our diplomatic interest in persuading. We need to gain that back. There are a lot of things that we have to do in our own country uh, to, to pull these things ahead. Iran is a central focus of our struggle for this, and our struggle as well to try to understand where we go. So I say that not out of an excessive sense of chest beating, but as an effort to try to get what I would call an objective analysis, uh, because the worst and hardest thing I find is in your own country to be totally objective <laughs> as much as you can about what to do about change. And it's very hard. It's a struggle. It, it is defeated by nationalism, it's defeated by a sense of right, it's defeated by amour propre, it's defeated by lots of things, and it's hard to come to grips with. I say one final thing. We're still a big player in the world stage, and in many ways, uh, the interesting thing is, despite all the criticism, some justified in my view, some not justified, we get, anytime there's a crisis, people come to us and say, well, what the hell are you gonna do about this? You know, they look to us to try to set some pattern, some way ahead. And much as we want to share, and I think that's useful, they sort of look at us to say, well, you make the final decision. Tell us, you listen to us where you want to go. This is hard. And it's hard not to become demanding and strident uh, and, uh, and hegemonic a little bit under those sets of circumstances. So those are those things. When we get to, to, to the problem that I thought Hussein described very, very well, uh, it's how do we take in this particular context the effort to move ahead. Here we are 1,400 steps behind where we are trying to deal with the rest of the world because we have no communication. Yep. And this is really quite disastrous. And communication isn't an instant forming, you put it in the teacup and you have solution, but it's a way of getting at the problem. And as I said last night, my final points, and I'll shut up, two or three things. If you're not talking to the other side, you don't know what they're really saying. Even if you hear what they're saying, you've got to spend a lot of time listening in order to understand what they mean, because often they themselves don't say what they mean for their own reasons, but they often don't understand deep down what they mean, just as we fall into the same trap. And it's extremely important in dealing international relations at some point in the dialogue to say, is this what you mean? Or I think I understand where you're going. What if we did this to deal with the problem? So there are ways in diplomacy to begin a dialogue to test some of the answers to these things. Mm -hmm. well, one reason why there's yeah. no communication is there's no trust. That's right. And if, if there is no trust, trust, even if you do have communication, yeah. it's not necessarily is this high is, quality. This is an awful circular problem right. that you have to find a way to crack. But this gap between the American self-perception and the rest of the world's perception <laughs> of the United States is fascinating. I know at Canada I would get an answer to that. Well, but I've, no, I've it's okay, you're, you're fine. It's I've a lived good subject. in both countries. Yeah. And one of the things that struck me, <laughs> and only struck me after I left yeah. the United States, States, yeah. was that there's an interestingly strong current of fear and insecurity in American culture. Sure. And so the United States acts around the world to protect itself. The rest of the world looks at the United States and says, how could such a powerful country possibly yeah. feel, insecure? feel insecure? There must be some yeah. other motivation going yeah. on. Exactly. Now, I have no insight into the Iranian self-perception. <laughs> so maybe Hossein or Jim, as a result of the project, you could yeah. tell us a little bit about why there might be a gap between the Iranian self-perception and the rest of the world, or at least the rest of the region's can, perception. Can I just right tack on. a question onto that? Yeah. We all know what it's like to communicate by email. Email works well for things like, at 10 o'clock we'll meet at a cafeteria. It works terribly for trying to communicate complex, right. deeper, deeper issues. Subjects. Right now, the US and Iran can't even communicate by email. Mm -hmm. They, and to extend the analogy, somebody sends an email to somebody else who then sends an email cover letter to somebody else and maybe it winds up where it's supposed to, even if it does, who can trust it? You know how easy it is to get into arguments over email. Right. You can't have 
You can't convey subtlety. You can't look at the body language. And right now, as far as I understand it, in Tehran, the, the individual representing American interests is a Swiss, and he works part-time. She. She works yeah. part-time. And in but, but her, her job is not to explain the U.S. No, her no, job no. is to handle the message. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Hand That's things it. over. That's right. So there's no mm -hmm. forum. Yeah. There's no embassy. Mm -hmm. There's no... Mm -hmm. And anybody mm -hmm. who tries to go around that mm -hmm. is suspect yeah. because why are they going around it? So, I mean, that that is something that has to be fixed if this is... If this box... If we're to get out of this box. David, uh, I understand very well the differences of the cultures. You explained about the U.S. This is almost uh, uh, the liberal uh, uh, culture you have in the whole West. And also in Iran, we are Muslim countries. We have uh, Islamic values. But still, I don't believe these differences is the real reason of disputes, hostilities, because uh, the U.S. has good relation with Saudi Arabia. The U.S. has strategic relations with Pakistan. Although everyone knows the most extreme version of uh, 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 Islamic extremism is coming from uh, Pakistan and Saudi Arabia. That. Uh, uh, despite of this fact, they have uh, good relations and issues like democracy, human rights. You, you don't see uh, stop the U.S. and Saudi Arabia for strategic relations. Uh, that's why... You may be a little more positive on these relationships than the reality is, but they're better certainly than they are with Iran. Yeah, yeah. much better. Yeah. I mean, you really cannot compare mm -hmm. it there. there, there. Even with other countries, I mean, they, every country, uh, they, they have uh, their own culture, uh, their own religion, but they can respect. To, to win Iran, if, if uh, the United States uh, is uh, really serious to enter a kind of uh, strategic dialogue with Iran to build the future, I think uh, it's not difficult. Although uh, I don't know whether the U.S. would be ready or not, just to uh, convince the Iranian uh, leadership that the U.S. is not after regime change and the U.S. is ready to build a relation based on mutual respect, non-interference. When you talk about regime change with respect to Iran, are you thinking change in president? Or you're thinking change in the fundamental constitutional fundamental. structure of the country? I mean, fundamental. Iranians, they believe uh, right after revolution, because the, the, the uh, strategic allies of the U.S. Shah, the dictator, was removed by revolution. The U.S. supported Saddam in order to bring a regime change in Iran. The war was the, the, the most uh, clear, from, from Iranian point of view, is the most important clear evidence that the U.S. was after regime change since the early days of revolution. And unfortunately, uh, we can find a lot of credible uh, indications that this understanding uh, of the Iranian side is right. I mean, when I'm talking with many fr uh, friends in the U.S. and in Europe in private, they say yes. I mean, still the U.S. cannot distract itself from the regime change idea. And if, if they can convey somehow uh, that uh, they are really uh, ready to uh, make a relation with Iran based on mutual respect, recognition of Islamic Republic and uh, non-interference, no domination, and more based on joint interests. I mean, because, because the U.S. also needs to recognize Iran has regional interests. I mean, the, the, the whole foreign policy of the U.S. since 1979 is focused on isolation of Iran in the region which is a direct challenge to legitimate interest of Iran in the region. 
<clears throat> Tom, how strong has regime change been as a theme in American policy toward Iran? And it's it's there? very interesting because unlike Iraq, there's never been any declaration that U.S. policy is regime change. There have been statements of deep concern about some of the governing processes in Iran, including in particular treatment of its own citizens, which we judge to be woefully deficient. We certainly were affected by what was the violent period following the revolution. It happens to follow all revolutions in the main and happens to vary in intensity with respect to violence, but nevertheless, it was there. Uh, there are other things that we would say we would object to. There are people in the United States who believe regime change is the answer. Uh, I don't believe they are represented in the government at the top as the dominant theme. Uh, but we have this very intense preoccupation with further proliferation in the region and Iran as a potential proliferator and that that will lead in our view to some consequences. These are questions in part because of what President Ahmadinejad said at various times in his career about Israel, uh, increasingly of concern among the Israelis who have had great influence in the United States in pointing uh, probably more often than the statements were made to the statements themselves as motivators of their deep concern that a nuclear armed Iran will in effect carry out what President Ahmadinejad said uh, were at least his personal expressions of Iranian policy. I think we have to basically take it to that. Uh, so those then have raised concern on the U.S. side that that plus some actions that were taken in Iran, particularly before 2003 with respect to their nuclear program, which I described last night, uh, have given a sense of more than verisimilitude, if I could phrase it that way, uh, to the fact that some Iranians at least were fooling around uh, in the direction of creating a nuclear weapon. Uh, all of that's raised this mistrust and misunderstanding, if you want to call it that, because the other current that runs in Iran is declarations. But the idea is now, okay, we're not going to get anywhere until we increase pressure. And some of the history of this, uh, in a strange way, has been that in 2003, Iran made decisions that seemed to move it in a direction away. Well, why in 2003? Well, we had just defeated Iraq and the real, the, the, the bad stuff hadn't started in Iraq. And so the interpretation is good or ill, we never had any conversation about this, that Iran moved because we put all the pressure on through our presence in Iraq. Uh, and everybody makes those conclusions. The same way the Supreme Leader has said, what a terrible mistake Gaddafi made to get rid of his nuclear weapons. We had no nuclear weapons to get rid of his nuclear program. Well, it was a joke. Uh, but the notion is once you get rid of your nuclear program, the U.S. comes down on your back and you're finished. So you can see how these things go. And we have right. counterparts on each side. Uh, but Tom, I can understand. Pieces of I misunderstanding. So final point. Uh, increasing the pressure on Iran has given every evidence to Iran that the pressure is designed to change the regime. Because many of the characteristics right. of the pressure, including threats of military attack, or statements about military attack and increasing sanctions, and increasing efforts to rally people around Iran, and lots of people talking about regime change who talk for themselves in the main, uh, but may have been part of regimes in the past or governments in the past and not in the past, are all the things that are there. Now, one explanation, of course, is to merely put pressure on Iran so that we have a diplomatic door to walk through. Uh, but that hasn't been as persuasive as the other view, in my view, that all we want to do is to, in fact, bring Iran to, 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 to its knees. Uh, one view of that is to bring it to its knees so it'll accept our equation for the future of their nuclear program, which is essentially, at this stage, a dispute between no enrichment and limited enrichment. This gets incredibly complicated. And the notion that why would you want to take away the pressure when it seems to be working, uh, even if the pressure itself is beginning to lead to understandings in Iran, which are stiffening Iran's spine with respect to resistance to the United States on the very questions we would like to motivate them on. And so there's not, in my view, a fine-grained feel for this, uh, nor is there a, a sense that the debate that goes on in the United States has ever been resolved between the combination of pressures and diplomacy. It's mainly, as Hussein pointed out last night, up until now been all pressure and very little diplomacy. I can understand why people would worry, for example, about Saddam Hussein getting a nuclear weapon, because the man had a 
track record of invading his neighbors, and he's on record saying that he wished he had waited to invade Kuwait until he had a nuclear weapon. He clearly did have avowed hegemonic ambitions in the region. Iran's never invaded its neighbors. What exactly would be the big fear of Iran with a nuclear weapon? Well, we, we had the hostage crisis. Uh, we had mining in the Persian Gulf. We had a whole series of steps and actions which extended Iranian influence along the Shia in South Lebanon, the creation of Hezbollah, support for the Palestinians and their armed struggle against the Israelis, which we opposed, uh, the things like the Karine shipment and so on. So it wasn't devoid of evidence and it wasn't made up of whole cloth and it wasn't in the imagination. Uh, and the notion was very clearly these were all directed uh, against an American ally. They were all directed to try to militarize the problem rather than to demilitarize it. They were all directed at ways that in our view interfered with the potential for negotiation, particularly as they created problems in Israel and the public statements about Israel uh, from someone that people uh, considered to be, quote, the president of Iran and therefore the authoritative spokesman for Iran raised all these problems. Well, I can only tell you they added obviously to the confusion and the difficulty. Well, though it's hard to tell a story that makes it sound like it's a smart move to attack Israel once you get a nuclear weapon. It is very hard to do that. On the other hand, if you're in Israel and one weapon will wipe out your country, yeah. uh, and maybe you don't believe your deterrent is very effective or all these other things, or you'd rather not take a chance, or you'd rather not have a region and then first Iran and Saudi Arabia, then Turkey, then Egypt, right. maybe the UAE, whatever, all go in that direction uh, to defend themselves against the possession. Uh, that's a difficult question. And there's very little trust, unfortunately, in the Supreme Leader's statements in his fatwa uh, that he won't someday change that. Well, the thing that will change him the most rapidly, in my view, is the stupidest thing is to go and attack him. Because then he says, look, I said I'm going to make nuclear weapons and I, we're going to defend ourselves conventionally. We've been attacked. We have right. to defend ourselves. So, Hussein, the flip question <laughs> here is, why is it worth all the trouble? and the aggravation, having a nuclear program. Why wouldn't it simply be easier for Iran to say, okay, never mind, this just isn't worth the headache? No, first of all, it's important to understand Iran uh, was uh, uh, the victim of uh, the U.S. and European proposal to nuclearize Iran. When we had a revolution in 1979, the policy was completely changed. Iran decided not to have uh, ambitious nuclear projects of, of Shah. But exactly in the time, you remember before revolution, all Europeans, they were competing to, to win the, uh, the, the lucrative projects mm -hmm. to nuclearize Iran. But right after revolution, exactly the time the revolutionaries decided to uh, uh, delete the huge nuclear projects, fuel cycle, uh, 23 power plants, and so and so. Iran uh, had paid uh, about uh, seven, eight billion Deutsche Mark to Germany. We had only one power plant, and Iran just decided to finish this one because 90% was finished. And some other small projects, which Iran already had paid, Iran, for example, paid $1.2 billion to France in order to have a joint uh, venture on enrichment in France. Uh, but that time, despite the fact Iran remained committed to NPT, to forego, delete all big nuclear projects of Shah, which already cooked with the US, the, the West withdrew from all contractual agreements and left Iran with billions of dollars of unfinished projects. What was the option for Iran? Iran had nuclear reactor built by the US, 1967, Tehran Research Reactor. Iran needed fuel rods to run it. Iran had 90% uh, Boucher power plant finished seven, eight billion Deutsche Mark paid, and the West was not ready to cooperate on their NPT to finish it. For a decade, we were talking with German, please finish this one, and nobody was after the second power plant in Iran. 
nobody had in mind to have enrichment program in Iran. But when the West rejected, especially the, 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 the war, believe it or not, changed the security calculations of Iran. Because Iran noticed that the neighbors, the Arab neighbors, they are with the support of West, they are after disintegration of Iran. This was very, very clear evidence. And also Iran noticed that the, uh, the, the neighbors, the West, uh, they would support even the use of weapons of mass destruction against Iran. This changed the security calculation of Iran. This was one issue, war, use of chemical weapons, use of missiles, and from the other side, also billions of dollars of unfinished projects, which Iran had paid for. Then they, they decided they, they had no other option, David, to go for self-sufficiency to finish the projects. This was the reason. Uh, on regime change, uh, I agree with Tom, uh, which there has never been official statements by, uh, by US official about regime change. But uh, in Iran, not only the practical measures, policies, but even the statements, Tom, you should help me to understand. Uh, Obama administration labeled Iran a prior state. Bush administration labeled Iran access of evil. Clinton administration labeled Iran rogue state. The, the, the Bush administration father labeled Iran number one state terrorism. These are great See? compliments from the great Satan. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Iran, right. I mean, all of them, all of them, they have labeled Iran uh, giving you impression if Iran is access of evil, therefore there should be a regime change. Tom said uh, this was official policy about the U.S. on Iraq. But the U.S. said Iran, Iraq, North Korea, they are axis of evil. Right. What it does mean? Well, I think we'll give, that we're, we're out know, of time, you, I'm afraid. You, but. you forget that uh, in your country, too, almost to the point of total boredom of both Americans and Iranians, the great Satan mantra is chanted. Yeah. And we know, yeah. in fact, that right. I thought David had, yeah. you know, in a nice way, raised that particular. I, I think, of course, dwelling on the history it's fascinating because we find many equal and parallel uh, kinds of misunderstanding and mistrust. It's fascinating now, in fact, there is not a lot of disequilibrium in examining. It just happens to be entirely 180 degrees opposite right. in its effect and where it's going. And, and I think that this is a history of relationship even more vexed than perhaps our relationship was with the PRC before 1971, certainly at least as serious in many ways. Uh, and it's continuous. It's, it, it, the PRC relationship went from, from 49 to 71. So that's roughly 22 years. We're now into our third, getting into our 33rd year with Iran. It is not a record that either Iran or the United States ought to be proud of. It's not a record that in any way contributes uh, to the place and the role that each state should be playing, both in the lives of the other and its own ambitions and role and its relationship to the rest of the region. And the idea that there are creative ideas out there, Hussein's given you some, I have some, there are plenty that can be done. There are creative ideas for dealing with the nuclear question. The really fascinating question is, can we get the leadership on both sides to stand up? Yep. Can they do it at a time when they're under tremendous domestic tension? Can they see a plan through all of this? Because a, a one sparrow doesn't make a summer here. Uh, we have to start somewhere, and that's very hard. Mm -hmm. But once you start, can they then begin to talk about okay, where we could go if we could find a way through these problems. Here's what the problem is on our side. Here are the things on your side. Can we find a way to make those circles square, so to speak? I think there are, I think there are plenty of ideas. And, and Hussein and I worked together and we worked with others and we worked in different forms to try to fill the void uh, with creative ideas. Creative ideas are halfway. The really interesting question is, is there sufficient motivation? I personally believe that President Obama is so motivated. I believe that he has got lots of other problems to deal with. He has in many ways got to put these in the context where he spends his time and his priorities. 
Uh, he's got to get reelected if he wants to continue on. We don't know what he'll do after he's reelected. We have our hopes. Uh, so we have to begin to prepare, not just for the short term, to slow things down and to get us into what I would call a practice of let's try to find a way that we can moving, do number one, let's do no more harm. Let's shut up <laughs> for a while <laughs> talking about each other. <laughs> there are things you can do. Right. They're not dispositive, but they can begin to help. Then we can think about, okay, steps we should take. But if we begin to take steps that in the end, we'll recognize that Iran has a legitimate nuclear program to provide civil power, even if we'd see it disoriented in terms that it's all enrichment and no reactors for the moment, uh, but are prepared to go ahead and that's been done under the kind of transparency that gives us confidence that's really gonna work. That may be the best we're ever gonna get. And if Iran wants to continue to spend all of its money on one aspect of the nuclear program, and very little on the other, then it ought to re-examine its own approach here and talk to us about that and see where it's really going to go because these are the kinds of things that add to uncertainty on our side. Uh, similar, if the problem gets going and they say, well, look, you've done this, this, and this, and these are all aimed at changing our regime. And we can say, no, uh, we have an interest in obviously seeing you improve your human rights record. You're part of the international community. That's the standard. You ought to be there. And we also happen to believe in our humble view it accords with Muslim values. And it fits a view of what the world ought to look like that the, the, the monotheistic religions share. They don't dispute these. Can we move in that direction? So there are things we, but we're not talking, you know. Yeah, right. This is the problem. Yeah, right. So I can describe for yep. you optimistic conversation. I can describe for you really crappy conversation right. too. But I think, you know, we pay our diplomats to take the crappy and turn it into the optimistic. And there are things that you can do to make that happen. Well, sadly, we're out of time, but this has been a great uh, <laughs> antidote to, for those of us who read the newspapers every day and have a sense that it's a, a deeply hopeless cause. We'll but come here and talk to you about newspaper someday, two days. <laughs> so thank you all three for coming. Thank thank you. Talking today and to thank the audience, thank you for joining us for this special edition of Inside the Issues, the CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube.